Today's sermon is entitled, Cherishing the Gift. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say thank you. The reality is, is that it's almost Christmas time. It's just around the corner, and I hope and pray that you're thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only lying in a manger, but all the things that he has done for us. And we're going to find out in this sermon today, the list is certainly very long, and I'm only going to touch, you know, scratch the surface on what Jesus has done for us. But hopefully by the end of it, we'll be thinking about Christ, and we'll be thinking about what can we get him on his birthday. And I think what he really wants is us. He wants our devotion. He wants us to love him. He wants us to get closer to him and he wants to help us so i hope and pray that this christmas time that we'll not only draw nearer to god and he'll draw nearer to us but we'll also get out in the world and tell them all about jesus but before i get into that i want to give you a really quick skit and and i got thinking about this i got a a, a, an I guess just a story, a story about somebody who is in bed and they're getting ready for a really hectic day. So let me give you this story. As I hear the clock screeching in my ear, I roll over on my side and firmly turn off my alarm. I would like to say that I feel fresh and vibrant, ready to conquer the world, but I spent most of the night worrying about the crazy schedule I was about to endure. As I glanced at the clock, panic fills my heart, for I just wasted five whole minutes laying in my bed doing nothing. I leap to my feet, grab the clothes I laid out last night, and within mere seconds I find myself in the shower working quickly to put enough soap on myself so that I might at least smell decent. After I get dressed, I comb my hair, I powder my face, and I race to grab a banana and my briefcase, and out the door I go as fast as I possibly can. As I'm driving my car, I bury the needle just 10 clicks over the speed limit in the hope that no reasonable police officer would ever stop me for such a minor infraction, and i got to make up the time anyway. As I weave in and out of traffic like an Indianapolis 500 racing car driver, I recite in my mind the checklist, the things I've got to do today just to make sure I don't forget something. I got thinking about it. i got to pick up dry cleaning at 8. I got a meeting at 8.15 with the auxiliary club. I have a 10 o'clock shopping spree that I got to do to get ready for Christmas. At 11.30, I got to go back home, unpack all the groceries. Noon, I got to microwave my dinner and eat very quickly. 12.30, I got to jump in my car and race to the gym for a very intense but quick workout. 1.30, I got to go Christmas shopping. I got to get some more of that shopping done. It's almost Christmas time, so I got to go in and I got to fight all those crowds again. 3.30, I got to head to the clinic to get my COVID-19 shot at the other end of town. 5 o'clock, I got to race home to eat supper. 6 o'clock, I got to give the house a very quick cleaning. 7.30, I got to visit a friend who's been struggling with cancer and I really want to pay, you know, some, spend some time with them and let them know that I really love them. 9 o'clock, I got to set up my clothes for the next day. And at 10 o'clock, kiss the husband and crawl into bed phew it sounds tough but like i think to myself as i'm driving my car i have survived far worse than this schedule suddenly the horror fills my mind like the waves crashing on a seashore i have a child oh my goodness i do a 180 degree u-turn and i race back home to find my teenager at the doorstep waiting impatiently stressed beyond all imagination as he jumps into the car, frantically, I can't help but wonder to myself, is life supposed to be like this? Is it really supposed to be this hectic? Have you ever felt this way at Christmas time? The reality is probably we all have at one time or another. Life does get incredibly busy. And if we're honest with ourselves, our calendars get extremely full very fast. We like to go from place to place. We like to get lots of things done. We feel we have value in doing lots of things. But the reality is sometimes we're so busy that we can't stop and enjoy what God has given us. And as a result of that, we don't draw near and we don't get close to him. And we certainly should. I got thinking about the time is now, I think, right before Christmas time, especially to rejoice. The good news the prophets uh, only got to get a glimpse of, and the angels continued to ponder Micah 5, 1 to 5, that good news, that time period, that rejoicing, that Christmas time is almost here. To keep Jesus' voice and purpose from getting drowned out in all of the chaos of life, we simply must take time to be still, Psalms 46, 10, and draw nearer to God. So in turn, he might draw nearer to us, James 4, 8. 
when we intentionally carve out time in our calendars to walk by the still waters, lie down by the green pastures, and as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God, to have our souls renewed and restored, this is an incredible gift. I love this picture here of the little girl and she's sitting beside the still waters and, and, and she's thinking about God and she's thinking about her relationship with him and she's thinking about how do I get closer to him? We need to spend more time doing that. Or maybe that's not where you get closer to God. Maybe you want to go somewhere else. Okay, how about going to the very tops of the mountains? beautiful place that you can go. There's lots of mountains where I live. Go to the very top of the mountain and maybe you don't like heights as much. Well, I don't like heights either like this lady does, but maybe you want to go to another spot, but get on the mountaintop and, and look over all of God's creation and then start thinking about God and asking him to speak to you. Or maybe that's not your thing. Maybe the mountains are way too high and I understand that. Maybe your real thing is you want to go right beside the still waters. You want to go the lowest possible valley that you can find with all the rock cliffs on either side of you. And you just want to either sit beside a stream or lay in the field and dream about getting closer to God, talking to him, spending time with him. Or maybe you really just want to get by the water. Maybe you want to be like this guy. I know I've done this before where you get beside the, the water in a nice lake or a pond and it's nice and still and you can barely see anything. Maybe a duck off in the background. Maybe a fish might jump once in a while. But it's so calming and so relaxing it's a really good way to get rid of the chaos in our lives and actually think solely on God. Think about him and ask him, God, would you speak to me by these still quiet waters? Or maybe for you, life is really hard. Maybe it's really hard to, to free your mind of the chaos. So maybe you've got a spot within your own house. Maybe you can't get away, but you've got a spot, a little nook or a cranny a little place where you can go in like a prayer closet. And maybe that's where you go and you spend time to be alone with God. Or maybe possibly even you go to the field and you say, you know what, I want to go out in the field in my backyard and I want to talk to God there. Or maybe that's not your thing. Maybe what you really want to do is you want to take a stroll in the park. Now, here's the thing. It makes no difference. For he who is indivisibly present absolutely everywhere is right there with you. And if you ask and are ready to submit to his will, he will remove the chaos from your mind, mold and reshape you into the image in which you were created. Here's the thing. Can you talk to God in chaos? Absolutely. Of course you can. You could talk to God at any time, no matter what the circumstances are. But if you really want to hear his voice, if you want to concentrate on what he's trying to tell you to do in life, it does help to get rid of the chaos and to spend time alone in the quiet moments with him. And I think that's incredibly important. And we really got to be able to do that in our lives. So that's the first thing about Christmas. Take time to be holy. Find that time. Out of love, I think we plan for Christmas time to visit our loved ones. And we do. We look at all the different people that we didn't meet during this year because we're way too busy. We want to meet them during Christmas time. And they give us a great source of comfort and joy. And they certainly do. But here's the thing. I think God gives us far more joy than that by long shot. How much more important is it to visit our Lord at Christmas time? He is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. As our great fortress, he will take us underneath his wings, Psalms 91.4. He will trade our heavy yokes for burdens that are light. And even those burdens when they're light, and they seem like they're quite a bit to us, don't they? The reality is if we can persevere in those burdens and have faith in God, then it says in scriptures, we will become spiritually mature. I can't think of a better gift at Christmas time than God granting us more spiritual maturity. What a beautiful gift to have God as our portion, lovingly whisper reassurance into our ears that we are eternally, we belong as his heirs in his kingdom. And one day we're going to walk and talk with him in a restored Garden of Eden. It's important that we take time to be holy so we get this reassurance from God that he's not done with us yet. We are like jars of clay, easily broken. And when we get in a world of chaos, we can get broken quite easily. But here's the thing. Our potter, Jesus Christ, is more than capable of molding us and reshaping us back into his image and giving us peace of mind and giving us not only the ability, but I think the desire to draw near to him, to get closer to him. And I think at Christmas, that's an absolute must. I got thinking, you know what, and I look in scriptures and I try to find Jesus all throughout scriptures and I try to review his life. 
I think that's what we should be doing at Christmas time. Reviewing the life of Christ so that we understand the gift that we have received. Let's go back in scripture. A voice calling out in the spiritual desert amidst our chaotic lives is inviting us to make our path straight by becoming before our king and humbly ask him to remove our double-mindedness, James 4, 8, and to guide us into the path of righteousness for his name's sake, Psalms 23. To have the master mold these fragile jars of clay, one must confess one's sins and then be bathed in a single-minded devotion to accept his right and our joy to have him rule over our promised brand new hearts, Ezekiel 36, 26. It's a privilege to come before God and say, mold me, shape me, change me, modify me, make me more like you, Jesus. What a beautiful gift that is to spend time with our Lord. So when we go back in scriptures and we review the life of Christ, the first thing we find is John the Baptist saying, prepare the way to meet the Lord. So we should be doing that now right before Christmas. Start preparing the way to meet our Lord, Savior, and King. And I got thinking, you know what? While lots of soap can clean the outside of oneself, you know what? The reality is, is that what we fail to do in life, I think, is to clean the inside of the cup. That was the message Jesus had for the Pharisees. They were saying, you know what, we are religious. And the Pharisees were to a certain extent. And they had memorized scriptures and they liked the seats of honor within the, the synagogue. But Jesus said, you got to clean the inside of the cup. You got to make sure that your heart is devoted to Christ. And I think that's so incredibly important. As we get closer and closer to the day in which Jesus Christ was born, the celebration of his birth, we've got to sit back and say, yes, Lord, I want to be more like you. I want the inside of my cup clean ultimately so that I can get closer to you and I can celebrate your love. Through confession, the guilt and the shame of falling short of God's glory is washed away and driven as far as the east is from the west. What a beautiful gift this is to be washed by the blood of the Lamb and truly to be right in the sight of our Creator. How many times have you laid in bed wondering, am I doing the right thing in life? How many times have you sinned and fallen short of God's glory and you felt incredible guilt and shame? Or maybe you're holding some of that guilt and shame this morning. Maybe that's, that's on your mind right now. Maybe you're thinking about that guilt and shame and saying, how am I ever going to be forgiven? How am I going to get rid of this burden and this load that's on me? Confession. Ask Him to forgive. That's so important. So when John the Baptist said, I want you to prepare your way, your heart, your mind, your soul to meet the Lord. He was saying, confess, confess and make sure that you're right in God's sight through your confession. I love this picture here. It's about uh, a lady who's bound before the Lord Savior and, and, and through her confession, she's getting closer to him. Confession does not come without first taking time to intently and with the aid of the Holy Spirit to examine one soul. Psalms 139. David talked about this. He said, O oh Lord, search me, O oh Lord. If you find any sin in me, Lord, tell me what it is. The problem is we live in a fallen world. And the problem is we live in a world that, you know what? There's no such thing as right or wrong anymore, it seems. It's a world that's gray. Nobody believes in the absolute truth, and they certainly don't always believe in the Bible. And when we get out in the world and the world tells us, oh, it's okay to do anything that you want as long as you don't infringe on the rights of others. We've got to challenge that statement and say, no, no, no. Whatever God says is right is truly right. Sometimes I think we get so confused about morality and about what is right that I know we have to spend time in front of God and ask him, God, am I doing the right things? I'm not even sure if I am anymore. And we've got to ask him, search my heart, O Lord. During the chaos of Christmas season, we need to slow down so that we might reflect on the truth by which we have been set free. John eight thirty one to 32. The babe lying in the manger freed us prisoners of, to sin through his atoning sacrifice on the cross. No, not so that we could choose to be enslaved by rigidity or overbook calendars, so that we might have life and might have it abundantly. To truly be washed by the blood of the Lamb requires us to receive God's commandments, not as a burden, but as a source of joy, 1 John 5, 3. For what the prophets intently searched for and the angels pondered, we get to experience, and that is Christ. Upon confession, we get the wonderful gift of meditating, studying, you know, and taking the empty voids where sin used to crouch and lie. And once all that sin has gotten rid of, what should we do next? Fill it with God's presence. In other words, clean the inside of the cup and get rid of all the filth and all the sin. And when you get that great big void in your heart, that area that's now been clean, fill that with God. 
Fill it with God. Replace our vain, destructive, broad path wanderings with God's righteous decrees that are holy and truly pleasing. This is the gift that Christ offers us right before his birthday and every single day of the year. I got thinking about all the times that Jesus ultimately appeared unto us and all of his life experiences. And I want to go through some of them just to give us a sense of, wow, joy, incredible joy of what Christ has done for us. For instance, if we go back in scriptures, wouldn't it have been nice ultimately to, you know, spend time with our Savior? Wouldn't it be nice to be out in the fields and you're watching your flocks at night and all of a sudden the angel of the Lord appears unto you and says, oh, by the way, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has been born. He's lying in a manger. The Messiah? Wouldn't you be excited? I'm sure. I know I would be very excited. I'd be the first one to run. Where is he born? Go look at the star in the east. And I would say, where? Bethlehem? I'm headed there. I want to go see my, my, my Lord. That would be excited. To read these stories, though, invites us to meet Christ, especially on his birthday. And I got thinking, wouldn't it be nice to be there as part of Mary's one of her relatives? And we know the story where Jesus, he kind of, he, he spent his back at the temple. And, and Mary and all of her crew, they take off and they're heading off and they've left the Passover. And after a day, they start asking, where's Jesus? Where did he go? And they're all looking for him and nobody can find him. And they go back to the Passover and they go back to the temple and they find Jesus in the temple. And there he is teaching teaching the elders at the temple. He's teaching, he's listening, and he's answering a whole bunch of their questions. Wouldn't it be nice to be there when Jesus was actually teaching them? What a beautiful experience. Or what would it have been like, ultimately, to be there when Jesus went up to Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and told them, I want to make you fishers of men. And immediately, it says in scriptures, they drop their nets and they follow Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being at your workplace right now and you're working away and you're trying to make you know, money in order to feed your family and Jesus comes up to you and says, oh, by the way, I want to make you fishers of men and women and I want you to go out there and be a missionary. And can you imagine dropping your work at that moment and saying, that's it, I quit and off you go. That takes incredible faith. Wouldn't it be nice to be there just to, to see the look on Peter and James and Andrew and John, their face? A reassurance, their faith that they had would be incredible. Wouldn't it be nice to experience that ultimately with them? And wouldn't it be nice if we could go back in scriptures and actually experience when Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist? Remember what John said? He said, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals, Jesus, and you want me to baptize you? And Jesus says, yes, you must do this because that's going to fulfill scripture. And you've got to do this because it's going to be an example for the world to let them know that they, once they become saved, are to be baptized too. Wouldn't it be nice to have been there and to see the dove come down and land on Jesus and see that wonderful and beautiful experience? And I got thinking, you know what? Wouldn't it even be nice to be there with Jesus in the temptation of the desert? Can you imagine going 40 days and 40 nights without uh, food? Oh my goodness, that would be so incredibly difficult. Remember, Jesus was God, but at the same time, he was also human. So the human part of him would be very weak, for sure, and, and would be looking for food, would be starving, literally. And when the devil comes and tempts him, Jesus tells him to go away. I'll only worship God. That's it. I'm not going to worship you, Satan, at all. And can you imagine being there in that moment and hear Jesus say, no. What thrill that gives us, because, you know, at Christmas time and all times of the year, sometimes we get tempted and we give in to sin. And it's so nice to hear this story about how Jesus was able to say no. And this is the great part. It says in scriptures, the very same spirit that was with Christ, that spirit lives with an awesome. We can say no to sin too. And that gives us incredible hope. And I think it certainly does. Wouldn't it be nice to be there ultimately when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount? He redefined the blessed. Not as the rich, the famous, and the powerful, as this world says, but instead the poor, the meek, the merciful, pure in heart, and the peacemakers. Or when Jesus said to the young man, he said, get up, and the widow's son came back to life in Luke 7, 11 to uh, 17. I especially would have liked to have been there amongst the crowds when he taught uh, the parables. Remember all the parables Jesus taught? I'll just give you a couple of them. The, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the hidden treasure, or the pearl, the net, or the landowner. All the different stories that Christ had told. Wouldn't that be amazing to actually be there? 
The wonderful part is, is that we can be there, kind of, because we can pick up God's holy word and read about it. And if we read with the Spirit's help, we can actually experience very similar to what the people at the time experienced. And that is Christ's wonderful, and beautiful teachings and presence. And I got thinking, wouldn't it be nice to be there ultimately when uh, Peter climbs out of the boat and he walks on the water? What would it be like to be in the boat? What would it be like to be one of the disciples? And you're in the boat and there's this fierce storm and you're expected to die. And you're looking at the storm going, we're goners. And then you see Jesus walking on the water. And then all of a sudden, one of your comrades, one of your friends, your colleagues, gets up and starts walking on the water too. Can you imagine what that experience would be like and how much that would increase your faith? And what would it have been like to be there when Jesus fed the 5,000? You know, that'd be incredible. Five loaves and two fish, and he feeds 5,000. And if you add the, um, that 5,000, by the way, is only the men that are counted there. But if you add the women and the children, it was probably, it could have been 15,000 or more. Can you imagine? What a beautiful miracle that was. And ultimately, I think for me, I would really love to be there during Jesus' difficult times especially. I'd love to witness Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says that he was in anguish and he sweat like drops of blood. I'd love to be there to see what he went through for he had a huge decision to make. It says in scriptures, Jesus said, no one takes my life. I give it freely and openly. So Jesus had a decision. Would he obey God the Father in heaven? Would he give his life for all of us? I would have loved to have been there to see him struggle, especially in his human self, of the decision that he knew that was right and he ended up making out of love for each and every one of us. Or what would it have been like to have been there and, and to see the soldiers mock and flog Jesus? Or what would it have been like to actually see him crucified? These are important things that we can read about. We can read about these events. And should we read about them? Absolutely. Why? Because we want to know our grace. You see, the more we understand what Christ gave up, you know, to come here, to empty himself, to live amongst us, to be ridiculed and mocked and to be abandoned by his family and often by the disciples, you know, for him to be flogged and beat and, and to be scorned and, and to be mocked and to be put on the cross, when we understand everything that he suffered for our, us, to save us, that means our grace has incredible value. And this is what I hope we focus the most at Christmas time on. For by grace ye are saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. We've got to understand our grace ultimately so we can fully understand the precious and the beautiful gift that we have received. So what I'm trying to say is please take time to be holy. Find that place that's very quiet, that place where you can spend time with the Lord. Talk to him. Speak to him. Listen to his small voice. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Let him show you the way, the truth, and the life. And when he shows you the sin that's in your life, confess that sin and ask him to fill that part of your life with only good things, things that would ultimately please him. In other words, obey all of his commands. And ultimately, as he draws nearer to us, may we rejoice in the fact that he sacrificed greatly Christ did on the cross in order for us to have that privilege to spend time with him at Christmas and to experience all these beautiful stories that are in God's holy word. We get to experience them because the spirit of God lives inside of us. And I want to give you just one more challenge, if I dare, just one more, and that is go and tell it on the mountain. You know what? The reality is we're in a really good spot, I hope and pray, especially if we spend time alone with Christ and we understand more about grace. We have an opportunity to tell the world all about it. We got to get out there and tell the world that Jesus Christ loves all of them equally and in the same manner. Many will open their gifts on Christmas morning and even though the gifts may be a sign of being loved, economically privileged and a source of temporal joy, they will still leave the recipients enslaved to sin ever looking for but never finding the truth in which they were set free. Hebrews 12, 1, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 7. How can they be lifted out of the muck of their own desperation and have their feet planted firm on the foundation of the Lord if we as Christ ambassadors choose to remain silent and hide our light under the bushel of indifference or worse yet, the fear of persecution this Christmas? Surely in taking time to be holy this Christmas, we will still, we will become so compelled, I think, to share the same comfort we have received to those around us that we're going to tell the people of this world, you will remain forever restless, fearful, and incomplete 
until you get under the wings of Christ who purchased you at the price of his very life. He loves you very dearly and he died on the cross for you so that through your confession and your belief is in his atoning sacrifice, you become born again as one of his very own children. This world needs to hear that glorious message. How many times have we searched diligently to give a loved one a gift, to have them open it and try to hide the best they can, their indifference or worse yet, absolute disgust that we knew them so very little. This Christmas, offer this world the very best gift that you can the truth concerning the babe lying in the manger. Those whom God formed in their mother's womb need to know that they're fearfully and wonderfully made, not to live apart, but to draw near and to have a close relationship with their Creator, their Redeemer, their Lord, their Savior, and their King. And if by the grace of the Lord and through their faith they open the precious gift called salvation, rejoice for a miracle passing from death to life has happened in front of your very eyes, not just to the person who got saved, but you get to experience, you get to see it firsthand. And that is one of the best gifts we could ever get. So I want to encourage you. It's almost Christmas. There's still time. Please take time to be holy. Please draw near to God. Please confess your sins. Please uh, be washed by the blood of the Lamb and be as white as snow. And as you draw nearer to God, please understand the grace and the wonderful things that Christ has done for us. And out of absolute gratitude, the very best that we could possibly offer as a human being, may we tell the babe lying in the manger, I have a gift for you. It's the only one I could ever give you. The only one you've ever asked. I love you, Lord, very much. And I will serve you from now to the day I die. And I will go on the mountain and tell the whole world about this beautiful gift called salvation. The prophets got to look at this gift, but they never really got to open it. The angels ponder and think about it, but they don't get to experience it. But Lord, I have experienced it, and I want to tell the world. May this be our gift to Christ on Christmas ourselves, our devotion, our love to our Lord who loved us first. May you have a wonderful and a beautiful Christmas, and may you get closer to your Lord because he truly does love you. Amen.